that in this series, we've covered quite a bit of ground about God's light. And this little note sheet might be something helpful for some of you, if only one, it might be helpful for you if you hung this on your refrigerator. Week one in this series, we talked about this, how to be a light to the, to the rest of the world. Like the Bible says that once we've received Jesus, he moves into our heart, his light lights up the world, and so therefore we get to be a light to a dark world. Last week we talked about how to shed some light on your calendar. Really? I want to I give you the statement that I used last week. You run your calendar, your calendar doesn't run you. Isn't that refreshing? Come on, think with me here this morning. You run your calendar. You get to put what you want on it. Your calendar doesn't run you and dictate your life. And now today, what I want to talk to you about is distractions. I want you to say that word with me, distractions. Some of you in the last four minutes that I've been speaking have already been distracted many times. You're going, uh, if, if this is my first time here, this guy is a weirdo. I'm really distracted. You might be thinking about your children. You might be thinking about what you're going to do after service today. You might be looking at your watch or taking a look at your phone and thinking about what text I didn't read yet this morning. And distractions happen. This is our theme verse of this series in John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I'm the light of the world, and whoever, come on, say whoever. Whoever follows me will never, come on, say never. Whoever will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So let's start our service out asking you, where are you with Jesus Christ? Uh, I would love to be able to have the blessing of an opportunity to walk with you and talk with you if you're kicking the tires of faith. If you're wondering, what would it look like to actually walk with Christ? Now, for some of you, you've been doing this for a very, very long time. You've got lots of questions still today. You seek out the scriptures or you watch somebody on television. You Google videos to learn more and more about Christ. And kudos to you. But for the rest of you, or some of you who might be here, who really haven't made that decision quite yet, I want to tell you that I'm a freak when it comes to Jesus. I get excited about it. I'm passionate about it. I get all fired up. I don't think that there's time for me to sit on my thumbs at all when there's a dying world out there who desperately needs Jesus Christ. And I want to go out there and I want to preach it and speak it and go out on the street corners and, and, and speak the word to people and help as many people as I can in my life. And that's what I dedicated my life to. So I'm not asking you to do that today. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable or start twinging or get distracted. This is just the way I want to live my life. This theme verse says that once Jesus comes into your heart, he starts to light up your life. And that's really the whole purpose of this series is to help you understand that God said in the beginning, uh, he created light and light came over the darkness, over the hovered water, or hovered darkness over the waters and all this. Boom, light was introduced and light got introduced into our life when we received Jesus. I want to give you a scripture today. If you want to go into the Bible, you sure can. There's two different places you can go. The first one we're going to look at, I'm going to have both of them up on screen. The first one, however, is written by the guy who wrote our theme verse, John, and it's in a letter, 1 John 5, uh, th uh, 1, 5 through 10, and here's what it says. This is the message that we heard from him and declared to you. Now, this is after Jesus has died and gone into heaven, ascended into heaven. Uh, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie. And do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Stop for a second. Don't go to the next, next part of this. Thank you. I exactly. Pastor Steve, by the way, this is our pastor, uh, associate pastor Steve. He just said, thank you, Jesus. And I, th I think that when we do study this scripture... We do have to thank Jesus for the finished work on the cross, for the blood that was shed that purifies us from all evil. This is the cool thing. When you have light in your life, you're going to be introduced to darkness in the world. So how do we not get distracted by all of that? That's what we're going to cover today. The passage goes on and it says this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to purify us. Uh, and forgive us of our sins 
uh, and from all unrighteousness. And if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So this is where I want to go today. I want to give you 10 things that distract us from God's light. I know that's a lot. If I get through all 10, great. And if I don't, I'll be on my watch. So I don't distract you and keep you here too long. Okay. 10 things that distract us from God's light. I would tell you this. Each time I, I preach on Sunday morning, okay, I can't see most of you right now. Uh, these lights are in my face. And I, 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 I can't tell out really who's sitting where, except for Pastor Steve and, and, you know, this crazy couple up front. But I can't see you. And I wanted to make that observation today because when we're filled with the light, we don't get blinded by the light. We walk in it. And it's bright. And it's brilliant. And so when we see others, we don't have to see their sin. Let's go on to these 10 things. If you are a note taker and you want to pull out that note sheet, I've got some fill in the blanks for you. And I purposefully made the font that small. <laughs> I purposefully made the font that small in a series about God's light. Number one subject. Number one on the list of distractions is money. Money, 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 money. It distracts us from God's light. This is so true. Money distracts us from God's light. I'm going to give you several scriptures. This is the other part of scripture that I want you to, to check out today. This is Matthew chapter 6. If you want to go there in your Bible, you can follow along here as well. We're going to cover quite a few, quite a few verses here this morning. Jesus really talks about money. And I want to stop for a moment. If there's any one of these 10 that I'm probably going to camp on, it's going to be this one. Here's what I want you to know. I'm not after your money. I'm really not. Some people might go to, to a church and go, oh, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. Now is going to be the time when they're going to start talking about money. I'm not really after your money, but does the church need money? Absolutely. Every church does. Any church that you talk to, of course they need money. You know why? It's not to keep the building lights on, and it's not to pay the pastor. Do I get paid? Do we have to keep the lights on? Absolutely. However, that's not what giving is all about. Jesus teaches us a distraction. Now think about money. Think about your checkbook. Think about how often you're focused in on the wallet. Guys, I am too. I'm going to tell you that I get distracted by this all the time. What's in the checking account? Do we have enough? Do we not have enough? Can we go out to eat? Can we not go out to eat? We don't know how much is in there. Money distracts us. I'm not telling you that money is a bad thing. Money is not a bad thing, but the Bible says that the love of money becomes a God thing. This is what Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter 6, starting with verses 22 to 23. It says this, the eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And then the light within you is darkness. How great is that darkness? You know what he's saying? If we're constantly thinking and focused, do I have, listen, those of us who don't have very much, we're always thinking how we can have more. And those who have plenty, how can I have more? Money, the love of money is the root of all evil. The passage continues on. Jesus teaches us this morning in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and notice capital M money. Jesus made it out to to a, a God that served. Way back 2,000 years ago, people worshipped money. Keep going. Verses continue. He keeps teaching, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not your life more important than the food and the body more important than clothes? Now look at the birds of the air. Do they not sow or reap or store away in the barns? And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Now, I want to skip forward because he does some more teaching, but then pick it up in verse 31 through 34. This is what Jesus says, again, about this distraction called money. So do not worry, he says. Anybody in here, and, and, and you don't have to raise your hand because I want this to be discreet between you and your heart and God, but do you ever worry about money? 
I'm guilty of it. I am. Oh, how are we going to make it? It's tax season. Oh. My buddy Bob called me up the other day. And he said, you know, I just, I, I had to call and ask you your opinion. What do you think about anxiety? And I'm like, anxiety? That's an interesting question, Bobby. What happened? He said, well, you know, I went and I bought this new truck. And I had a different truck. And the old truck was working just fine. I don't know why I went and bought this new truck. But when I bought it, now I've got this $650 car payment every month. And he said, my wife and I, we have plenty. And we can afford it. It wasn't as though it was a big deal for us. They could afford a, you know, a $40,000 truck or whatever. Which, by the way, what happened to the vehicle prices? Oh, my goodness. A third and second mortgage, right? What in the world? So he's, he's freaked out. He said, I lost an entire week of sleep worried about something that I could afford. What do you do with anxiety? What do you do with worry? Jesus teaches us in verse 31 to 34, so do not worry. What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. Would you underline that if you're a Bible, Bible person? Would you underline that in your Bible? Your daddy in heaven knows what you need. He doesn't always focus on what you want, but he knows what you need. But I think he cares about what you want too. Pagans run after all oh, this money, 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 money. Got to have some more money and more things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is saying, prioritize the light that I put into your heart. Put that first and focus on money down the road. It's important to be a good steward. Don't hear me wrong. Just don't make it out to be a God thing. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow or worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If you agree with that, would you give me a big old amen in this house? I want to give you an application statement that's on your notes today. Do not give to get. Do not give out of generosity to get, but rather give to give. Have a spirit of generosity about you. Watch what happens when the light of Christ lights up your life and you move into a spirit of generosity. Just here, here you go. You can have it. It's all yours. God can, knows exactly what you need and he keeps blessing you with more. And you know what? We could sit and worry and we could stress and I'm never going to have enough. Or we could just say, you know what? I'm going to serve God and not love on money. Just be generous. Number two. Distraction. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but media. Wouldn't you agree the media distracts us today? If you do say amen in this house, media distracts us. I got some examples up there I think are important. TV, radio, internet, video games, movies, newspapers. I just want to get right to the application of that. I would say, I talk about this often at our church because right now technology, I don't think it's going away. We most, most of us have one of these things, and by talking about distractions, you might be going, oh, I wonder what's going on in this thing right now. I wonder if I should go and check it. You might be thinking about maybe I should go and check it during a worship service. And here's what I would say. We look at this more than we look at our Bible. We focus in on what's everybody saying about me and did they like what I had to post? And eh. We get hung up with media. What's going on in CNN and on the news and we've got to look at more television programs. And here's what I'm saying. Entertainment is not a bad thing. But when it becomes a God thing, too much of a good thing that becomes a God thing is a bad thing. My application for you right away this morning is be careful on how much time you give to the media or even be willing to give it up if it's distracting your walk with Jesus. Last week as we wrapped up this, this, the series, uh, the service rather, I, I wanted to give those that were here a five-minute challenge. And I thought, what if for seven days we just said one little prayer when we got up in the morning and went to the Word and just spent five minutes of our day carved out that little piece of our calendar what would life look like seven minutes seven days later if we just took five minutes maybe we wouldn't get distracted so much by media number three 
This one is going to be odd for you, but it's church slash religion. Distracts us from God's light. Yes, this is what churches are designed for. This is what we want to share with you this morning. My wife and I, as we, we wrote a little bit of this talk together, we thought, what is church for? Why do we gather like this today in 2019 as a family, a worship of together? See, here's what's vital to the Christian walk. It can become distracting when churches and or a religious practice become the God. Jesus and church is his bride. So obviously, when we talk about a bride, we want to be there. We want to put on our makeup and make sure that the hair is looking good. Each time we have a Sunday morning service, it's like preparing for a wedding. And we want to make sure that all of the guests know that they can come here and get some help. We want to serve him together and hold each other accountable, which here's what I'm going to do. I love you. This is my friend Steve. Come on, everybody say once again, hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. I got to keep him accountable. You know why? Because he's my associate pastor. And you need him. You count on him. But you know what he does for me? Keeps me accountable. It's important that you sharpen each other. The Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. It's important that we keep each other accountable. So when you come to church, if you're struggling, we want people to be able to come in their weakness and say, hey, look, I'm here to share it. And I need somebody to know that I'm weak in this area. And I can go to this man and say, I've got a struggle right here. And I can't get past it. I can't get my mind around it. It's a distraction in my, in, in, in my walk with Christ. And it's, it's, it's a buffer of God's light to me. And he goes, well, hey, did you pray about it? <laughs> did you search the scriptures for it yet? Accountability. Right, buddy? That's right. That's what we're here for. And then praying for each other and loving on each other and worship of Jesus together and sharing weaknesses together and never, come on, say never. Remember what the passage says, the theme verse? He who walks in my light will never walk in the darkness. Never looking down on someone who's vulnerable with a weakness. And oftentimes today in our culture, it is so easy as we come to a church, as we gather together, that when a person comes in, They might not look right, they might not smell right, they might not speak right, they might not, they might not. But here's what I I need you to hear. You're welcome here exactly how you are. Flaws and all. In your sweatpants. We're going to love you. If you went and felt, got a tattoo, and you feel bad that you got a tattoo, don't feel bad about a tattoo. You got a tattoo? You got a tattoo? Okay? So we love you anyway. And if you have long hair or short hair, or if you're a little bit heavier set or a little bit taller or a little bit shorter, we're going to love you anyway, exactly how you are. And you're never going to be judged, ever. Because I don't want to play judge and jury over your life. I've got enough shortcomings of my own. Anybody agree with that in this house? Give me an amen. Are you excited about that? Is that, is that refreshing to you? Now, when I say that, I also want to be very respectful to other local churches and the global church itself. Because I believe that over the course of time, as I study what's called ecclesiology study of ecclesia study of church, that many times we didn't really even realize we were doing that. That passage that we read in the letter in first John today, be careful that you don't fall trapped, that you don't think that you, you don't have any sin in your life. And I think that as we grow in our Christian faith, we do draw toward God's light and we refrain from the darkness in the world. But it's easy to become prideful in that walk and looking down on somebody else who's got some shortcomings. But the best news is to walk further in the light is taking somebody who's got that, that life of sin and shame and regret and helping them in their faith journey too. Matthew 6, 37, Jesus teaches us, this is right after he taught us about money. He says this, do not judge and you'll not be judged. Do not condemn and you'll not be condemned. Forgive and you will be what? Isn't it great to be forgiven in this house today by Jesus Christ? Application for you that I'm going to give you right here in your notes is this. Get past that religion 
and pour into relationship with God and other people. Get past religion. I would tell you this, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Religion was made by man, spirituality is made by God. I respect religions, I respect systems and practices, but it was made by man. I'm going to look to that book and the Holy Spirit to guide our path. That's the light. Number four, distraction is this. Speaking of relationships, relationships. <laughs> relationships distract us from God's light. And I need to camp on this for a second. Boyfriends and girlfriends. Now, I don't know about you, but when I met Diane, I mean, it, we got 16 years coming up, she and I, this upcoming Friday of marital bliss, April 5th. I'm going to be married to my girl. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. I love that lady. But I, when, when we were crafting this talk, I thought about it. And back then, my head was on a swivel. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. Guys, I'm going to hammer on you for a second. I just done, did a bunch of research this week as we prepared. Every seven seconds, a guy is thinking about a lady. Did you realize that? Back then, I was thinking about a lady all the time. Head on a swivel. Oh, there's a pretty girl. Pretty girl. Pretty girl. Pretty girl. Uh, pretty girl. Uh, I wonder if she would date me. I wonder what I'd have to do to ask her out on a date. I wonder. I, wa I wonder if she likes pizza. Oh, pretty girl. Pretty girl. Pretty girl. And then I met my wife. Girls, you don't get off the hook either this morning. You think about guys every 51 minutes, according to recent studies. Guys every seven seconds. Women every 51 minutes. So there you go. But when we're focused more about finding a girlfriend or a boyfriend, we walk and get distracted from God's light. Buddies, what am I going to do on Friday? Oh, my buddies have been calling me all week, and everybody wants to go up on this trip, and we're going to ride snowmobiles. It's going to be great. We're going to go out in the snow. It's going to be wonderful. All my buddies are going to get together. And we prioritize that over Jesus, and it distracts us. Even siblings. I've had multiple conversations over the years with several people, and I'll say, hey, how are things going for you? Well, it's going real tough, real hard. Right now, Pastor, what's going on? Well, 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 tell me all about it. Yeah, but that's okay, Pastor. I don't really need to tell you. I've called all my family members right now, and they've given me all the advice that I ever need. Something goes away in, in, in life. Oh, I've got to call my sister. What do you think? I should, well, what's your opinion on what I should do next? Relationships. And then I've got another one on there. And parents in the room, hear me right. Kids, kids, priority order. God, spouse, kids. God, spouse, kids. Come on, let's say that this morning. God, spouse, kids. Kids are important. I love my kids. I, I, I want my kids to succeed. I want my kids to thrive in life. I want my kids to worship Jesus. However, when we're worshiping our children and what's best for them, and then I put one last one up here, and it's loving slash hating on people. Because, respectively, I wasn't going to put that word in there, but loving on people, that is wonderful. Jesus says, love God, love people, love God, love people. We've got t-shirts coming out here pretty soon within the next couple of weeks, and they say that very thing on it. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. That's all it takes to wrap up all the commandments in the Old Testament is those two things. Love God, love people. Come on, say it with me. Love God, love people. But what I've been seeing a lot is a lot of hate. And it's more important to spend life hating on somebody. Breaks my heart. Pastor Steve and I were talking about that this morning while we were setting up for the worship service. Is multiple conversations that I've, been, I, I've had in about the last year, and I'm listening. People just hating on somebody because of a political preference, because of a certain perfume they like, because of a gender. They're people. Love God, love people. John 3.11 says this, For this was the message you heard from the beginning. We should show love to one another. I'm going to give you an application for your notes today, and it's this. Be careful not to let a good relationship become your God. Pretty simple, pretty clean for you. Be careful not to let a good relationship become your God. Guys, if you're single in this room, here's what I'm going to tell you. 
Focus on Jesus, he'll bless you with a girl. Same to you ladies in this room. Focus on Jesus, he's going to give you the right guy at the right time. I speak this over single ladies' life all the time. So, Psalm 4511 says, The king is enthralled with your beauty. Let God himself, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, be proud of you and thrilled with your beauty and how amazing you are and let him bless you with a guy instead of seeking him out yourself. I have no idea why that... Can you guys see that right there? <laughs> see distractions! Triple A foundation for traffic safety. That's from last week. I don't know why that stayed up there. <laughs> All right. Number five distraction is this one. Routines. Routines distract us from God's light. May I ask you that question? What does your average day look like? We talked about our calendars last week and our schedule and, and a routine. I got to get up and then I do this and then I go here and then I have this and this is what I, where I prioritize it in my life. Routines are good. They're not a bad thing. But when they become a God thing, it's not so good. Acts 3, 1, Peter and John found themselves, notice the verse, it says, they were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. One of their disciplines in these days was 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. We're going to go to church and we're going to pray. That's what we're going to do. We're going to prioritize that into our routine. When our routine and our calendars, like we talked about last week, become our God and we're bound by that, we're distracted from his light. So here's my application for you. Make it a point to make Jesus part of your daily routine and be willing to abort your routine if you need to so that you can prioritize Jesus. Distraction number six is this one. It's huge for some of us. Work. Work, 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 work. Got to work, got to work, got to go to work, got to get work done. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work. I got to get work done. Got to keep working, got to make got to make the money, more money, money, money if I work just longer hours. It distracts us from God. Here's what I want you to know. I have a tendency to be a workaholic. Is there any workaholics in this house today? Any of you? Everybody else here is balanced. I can't see you really, so I don't even know if you have your arms up right now. There's a lot of workaholics. And if I just work seven hours every single day, seven days a week, that'll be 60, or what is that, 49 hours, right? But then I can always work the overtime, and then I can get more done now. So if I bump it up to 12 hours, seven days a week, and I just keep going, we get addicted to work. And here's what Anthony Robbins, who's a motivational speaker, says. Too many people... Today, think about work when they're at home, and they think about home when they're at work, and they become less effective. And guys, I will be honest and transparent with you from the get-go. I am the first one to admit there are times when I'm sitting at home, and, and, and my wife is like, dude, it is 930 at night. You've got to shut it off. Yeah, but I just need to call one more person. Now let me talk to this one more person. I just got to ask them a question about small groups and how, how, how they liked it. And I've got to ask this one person if they enjoyed serving this last. No, you can shut her down. Come on, say shut it down. Luke 10, 38 to 42, Jesus says it this way. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. And she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. That was Mary's job. I'm going to sit down at the Lord's feet and hear what he has to say. But Martha, on the other hand, was what? Distracted by all the preparations that she had to get made. And, and she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? I've got so much work to do, more and more work, and it's piling up. And tell her to help me. And Jesus said this, Martha, Martha. I like that name, Martha. Come on, Martha. You are worried and upset about many things, getting all the work done. But only one thing is needed, and Mary got it right. Mary has chosen what is better to sit and just listen to what I have to say, and it will not be taken away from her. Church, I want to encourage you with something. There are too many times we get fixed on working longer hours and putting in more time to make that money Distraction number one. And if I can just work longer hours, make more money, 
and, and then work a little bit harder. Then I can have a little bit more so that I can work a little bit longer to make a little bit more. And, and it's such a distraction from God's light. What if God just said, hey, take a chill and rest and listen to me. Let me talk to you. Let me speak some life into you today. Take a day off. I need to be honest. I'm going to be straight truthful with you. I preach Sabbath all the time. I believe in it. I believe that a, a, a proper day off where you're resting and eating good food and reading God's word and just chilling is imperative. I didn't take one for seven weeks. This last week, I took Monday off and Friday. I hope that's okay with you. If that's okay, would you give me an amen in this house? <sighs> Thank you <laughs> for letting me have a couple of days off this week. I feel a lot more fired up. Isn't it true when you're constantly working, fixed on work, focused on work, got to get more work done, thinking at work at home, home at work, when you're constantly fixated, it's so distractional. There's another one. Number seven, that's a huge distraction, I believe. It's creating memories. Creating memory. Now, there's nothing wrong with creating memories. Sometimes as we grow older, memories are all we have. But when creating memories is more important than creating memories with our loved ones, worshiping Jesus together. Mm. Now, I can't wait to go on a trip with my wife. We're going to go on a trip coming up here in May as well, hang out for a few days, get away. I love trips. Anybody like vacation? Anybody need a vacation? I love vacations. I can't wait for this snow to finally get off the grass in Jesus' name and melt, and we're able to go out and play Frisbee and create some daily little memories. However, hear me, creating memories for some can become a God thing. We just got to, we got to pack out our summer with all of these events and all of these, these trips and all of these various vacations so that we can create memories so that when we get old, we'll be able to remember back of what our life looked like. And I need to be transparent with you again. The Lord has blessed me with catching a lot of fish and some really big fish, but you know what? I don't remember most of them. Great memories. But if we're always chasing after memories and creating them, it's like chasing after the wind. Notice what this pastor named Bill Daniels, he's a kind of a good friend of mine, he says this, when we're fixed on creating memories in this life and not on the memories we have with our creator and the eternal, we store up for ourselves futile possessions. Luke 23, Jesus says this, then uh, I, I, to, a, to a guy who was sitting on the cross, standing I, I nailed to the cross next to him, a criminal, says, hey, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, truly, I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. This guy wasn't really fixated on, look at all the good things I did with my life and or even all the crummy things I did with my life. How can I just accept and receive you right now, Jesus, and create a memory with you in my final moments? Jesus responded, hey, you'll be with me in paradise if you just fix eight your life on me. My application for you, be careful not to live your entire life for creating remember when moments. Remember when moments are great stories. I love them but rather moments that they, they, they trump these remember when Jesus moments. Wouldn't you agree with me? If you had a chance to lead somebody to Jesus in this life, that's a moment that you don't forget. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a few weeks, we're doing a baptism, and these are moments when somebody goes under the, the, the water and they're proclaiming my old life is dead and my new life with Christ began when I hit a knee and I want everybody here to know it. This is my moment. And it is a Jesus moment that we get to share forever. I get to share with them. There are some in this room today who since legacy was birthed here 14 months ago, we had a chance to baptize them. And what a moment. We take a picture and that could be you if you haven't been baptized. Creating Jesus moment. Distraction number eight. I hope you're getting something out of this. 
Desiring a blessing from God more than God himself distracts us from God's light. God, I need a blessing. I need some more money. I need you to help me with that house. Get it fixed up. My lawnmower is bad. Lord, I, I, I need a blessing that's not material. I need to experience you right here, right now, today, in this moment. Give me, give me, give me. I need it, I need it, I want it, I want it. And we desire that blessing, and the blessing becomes a God versus God himself. Look at what Jesus said. This was that passage we read in Luke 6, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all of this will be added to you as well. There's a book out on our Welcome Center right now uh, written by a guy named Robert Morris called The Blessed Life. I love that book because Robert tried to outgive God. He, he, he had a moment with, in his ministry where he looked at his wife and he said, I think that I might be able to give, outgive God. I'm going to try it. See if I can. So he set a course and he gave away a car. Well, a month later, God gave him another car. And then he gave that car away, and a couple months later, God gave him another car. Like, we don't need two vehicles. Let's give this one away. And he continued to give cars away, and the value of the car continued to increase until one day he had preached at, at a church, and a guy rolled up with a full con brand new conversion van, $60,000 conversion van. And he said, here, God told me to give that to you. He gave it away. He said, I'm done giving away stuff. God, I don't know if I can outgive you, so I think I need to up the ante. He gave away his house. He didn't sell it. He just said, here, have my house. Gave it away to somebody. So he, the movie truck comes up. He packs up the truck, and he's going to go down. He has no idea where they're going to live. And he's sitting in the kitchen, and all of a sudden the phone rings, and he's having this conversation with God. He says, God, I'm, I'm trying to outgive you here, but I don't know where to go next. And maybe my plan wasn't working out so great. Got a phone call, and the guy on the other line says, why don't you come on down to the airport? So he drives down to the airport, and the guy says, here, here's a set of keys. Your brand new plane is sitting out there. Personal jet is sitting out there on the tarmac. God told me to give it to you. When we desire a blessing, however, like that, more, than God himself, it becomes a bad thing. My application for you is give God all of the glory and your life is truly blessed. That's, that's at the end of the day. Mother Teresa said it best. She just walked a humble life, humanitarian. She walked through this life basically in a cardboard box just trying to help as many people as she possibly could. She writes in her journals, man, this was a hard life. But she was blessed. She goes down in history. Number nine. I'm almost through this. Hang in there, you guys. Number nine, and this is a big one. I'm putting this up here for you, and that's the pastor. Come on, say that with me, the pastor. Don't let me be your God. I know I get an opportunity to come and use this microphone and speak life into you and talk about Jesus, and God has gifted and blessed me with the opportunity, a humble opportunity to be able to come and preach his good news, his gospel good news, and preach about his grace and forgiveness. However, I know that at times I can be on a pedestal for people in their life. And I'm going to tell you straight up, I don't have it all together. I'm a human being too. I, I, I make mistakes. I'm going to let you down. I, I, I don't want to. I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. That's my vow to you on behalf of God. But I'm going to say the wrong thing sometime. You might be sick and be in the hospital, and I didn't even know, and I forgot to send you a prayer card, and I'll let you down. And it's not my intention. I'm not out to do that or ever hurt anybody, but I'm a human being too, and I'm going to let you down. And sometimes pastors can be placed up on this pedestal like we have it all together, but we don't. We have the same bodily functions you <laughs> do. But I would say this when it comes to your pastors and leaders in the world today. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says it best in chapter 13, 17 through 18a. Have, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. In case you didn't know this, when I stand in front of Jesus, I have to give an account for my life as well as yours. So I pray that I treat you well 
and do a good job for you. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden for that. Would be no benefit to you. Pray for us. And I just underscore that for you. Can you, we, would you pray for me? I, I want you to know I'm praying for you like crazy. But would you pray for me too? I'm a human being. I need, I need your prayers too. And then it goes on. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. And I just put an application on here that's really applicable to me. Set your bar a lot lower with your expectations of a pastor. Because we're people. We're people. And we make mistakes. And we say dumb things. <laughs> Some of you are like, okay, you're talking about distractions. You're on number nine. When are we going to be done here? Number ten. Here we go. We're wrapping up right now. Ourselves. Ourselves, tied probably with money, really come in first place. Me. What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of it? When I go to the store, how can I benefit? When I go to the church, how am I going to be fed? When I hang out with another relationship, what can they offer me? We focus on ourselves way too much. Over this series, we've talked about various dietary plans that people get on, workout programs that people get on. Live your life. Live your life. If you want to take a diet, take a diet. If you want to work out, work out. If you want to run, run. If you don't ever want to run, don't run. If you're not into working out, don't do it. But we can fall into Christian vanity. And Christian vanity prevents us from God's light. It's distracting. <gasps> I've got to just take care of me. And if I can look good and feel good. Now, I would say very importantly that you can't take care of somebody else if you're not taking care of yourself. So it's important. Don't hear me wrong. It's important to take care of yourself. The primary workout plan that we have is our spiritual workout plan. Colossians 3, 3 to 4 says this. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life. I love that line in that verse. The whole purpose of this series is to tell you that one thing. If you accepted Christ in your life, he moved in. He is your life. Your old life about you is dead. All I can share is my personal testimony. That he took a washed up, old, beat up, drug addict, drunk, drunk from 20, 21 years ago. and changed my life forever. And I won't turn back. I can't turn back. I don't want to be that person anymore. That life, Dead. And my life is hidden with Christ in heaven forever and ever and ever. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Get an amen in this house. This is what we proclaim as Christians. My life dead. But he raised me up to something new. My application for you with this is Christ, make him your life. Focus on Jesus in your everything and he will be your everything. He will light you up. We're going to wrap up today, and as we do, I want to share one thing. There was a, a fella named Tony that I grew up with. Tony was one of my dear friends. I've spoken about him here at Legacy before. Good, good friend of mine. I grew up a little neighborhood buddy and whatever. We played street baseball and street hockey. He was the goalie. Well, you know those types of relationships that after a while, you start to drift apart just a little bit as you get older priorities change you don't see each other like every day it turns into once a week and then once a month and then every quarter and you call each other every six months and it it faded away like that tony was that kind of guy that i could call him at any given time and we'd pick up exactly where we left off you know that kind of friend yeah he was that friend and tony got sick and he said you know, I'd really like to have you come and see me. 
I think that'd be, a, that'd be good. And we had made those arrangements many times on the phone. Yeah, maybe I, we should get together one of these days. All he wanted me to do was drive over to his house and spend a few hours with him. But you know what? Distractions happen. And I blew it off. I blew it off. I don't know if you can fill in the blank of the rest of the story here. Tony died. And I did his eulogy at his funeral. Because of distractions, we have a Savior that we blow off all the time that I think wants to talk to us, wants to have relationship with us, calling on us all the time. Hey, Revelation 3.20, here I am. I stand at the door. I'm knocking. You want to let me in? I'll come in. We'll do some relationship. Do you want? Get back to you. And he knew it. He knew I'd blow him off. He knew you'd blow him off. But your God has got a brilliant light to flow in you and through you and over you and out of you onto others. And all he's looking, say, hey, come and spend a little time with me. Is that okay? So we're going to close in prayer today. I'm going to ask you just to bow your head and close your eyes with me. And let's just spend the rest of this sermon in just a little bit of quiet time with God. Would you just privately just cough something up to Jesus here in a moment and just tell him your life. If you've been distracted in your faith, tell him some of the distractions that you've experienced here. Maybe it was this morning or this last week. Over the course of this winter, you've had some distractions. Would you just tell God that? You'd like to ask him to remove those from you that you can focus on him, that he'd light up your life, that he'd be your everything. Jesus Christ, here we are in a moment. And as we're quiet, hear our hearts, hear our prayers, hear our thoughts. I pray, Lord, against distractions that detour us away from your light and the way in which you want to be a lamp to guide our path. I pray that you would meet us where we are here, right here in this moment. That you'd whisper into our ears right now, come and get away with me. And I'll give you rest for your soul. We know that in all things, Lord, you work for the good of those who love you. You've called on our life. You've commissioned us, commanded us. God, I pray right now that if somebody here is so overly distracted that before they leave your house of worship today, they would talk to somebody. They'd be vulnerable. Help us to be vulnerable with one another. Light us up in our everything, Jesus. That's our prayer. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.